We are, however, starting on a new module today. So we're looking at page 164 to 166 for now in your textbook, to which we're going to start looking at music compiling. So now we're looking at speciality shows. Okay, so that's what we're going to start looking at. So when I tell, when I say outside broadcast to you, what does that mean? What does outside broadcast mean to you? An outside broadcast is a show that is done outside of the studio and normally somewhere with an audience, normally somewhere where there are members who can see it. They do outside broadcasts at different places. So whether it be a store opening or whether it be at a concert, what's the difference between an outside broadcast and an activation? An activation is simply done for brand awareness more. So you can be there as a radio station. You can have your banners up. You can have your DJs there, um, people making music, uh, people handing out stuff. But an outside broadcast is where the show is live, just not from the studio. So in an activation, you don't have to do a broadcast. You just have to simply have stuff there. Okay, So you just want to be seen. So with today's technology, what do you need to do an outside broadcast? Um, mics, and you need to make sure that from the studio you do mic check first um, before you outside broadcast, maybe a few hours before or the day before, and a laptop that shows the show planning. Microphones, you need a laptop, you need internet, then you need a way of... What about a mixer? You, need a mixer. It's, it's... you definitely need a mixer. And then there's one other thing that you need. Um, mem you, can yes. I, mem you also need a transmitter to connect to the studio. So that's where I'm coming to. It's called a Comrex system. Hi, ma'am. Um, I wanted to ask, so do online radio stations also operate uh, outside broadcasts or is it just traditional radio stations? They have a means to it. It's just the case of it'll still be exactly the same as online, which means they can only stream by the internet. Okay, so you can only find it by the internet. So as you can see, there are quite a few things that you need to be able to do an outside broadcast. It's not just a case of mm, opening up your laptop and connecting to the internet and there you go. You're an internet station. The only reason you need a Comrex to connect is to connect to the studio, to be able to talk to each other. But if you are an internet-driven radio station, you don't need that because you can automatically connect to your radio station. You will only do that probably as a brand awareness exercise. Lane, in your textbook, outlines a following couple of team rules, along with com a commentary to help ensure that both listeners and audiences are catered for, uh, catered for effectively. So when you are doing your show from an outside broadcast, do you think that the way that you'll do your show is exactly the same as you would, or would there be something different? When you are at an outside broadcast, right, what do you think will be the difference? The difference is there are people live, right, in front of you, not just people that you're talking to that are on the air or via being on the air, so just people listening to you. So that means you have two sets of audiences. Why do we do an outside broadcast? Who would normally pay for this thing? Advertisers, mainly, okay? Unless a radio station wants to do an outside broadcast as part of their marketing for the radio station. But apart from that, it will be advertisers which pay for it. And if an advertiser pays for something, that means they are expecting to receive advertising within this three-hour segment. Your programming elements on a day-to-day -day basis won't change, but the way that you are doing the broadcast would be a little bit different. So let's look at these. Firstly, what is it that you're doing? You are still doing your show, right? So you are still broadcasting like you have been. The only difference is you should be doing it better. You should be adding more prep work into it um, with regards to your show. So all your regular features or benchmarks will still be there. None of this will be taken away. You'll be playing the same amount of songs that you normally would, no more, no less. Nothing really changes in that stance. So you'll do your normal interactive contest, but the only difference here is instead of getting callers on the line, you'll be playing it with the people that are there, the crowd in front of you. You as a listener will get nothing out of it if I simply tell you things like I'm at this event and I'm getting a suntan and it's wonderful. 
that means nothing to me as a listener. Okay, so I still need to re recall um, that I have my normal listenership base that I need to entertain, along with the people standing in front of me that I need to entertain. So you have two sets of audiences that you are now talking to, and you can't forget one or the other. What it comes down to is more prep work. You need to prep a little bit longer, keeping in mind that you are broadcasting for two sets of people. So normally, if you might spend four hours a day planning on your show in the studio, you need to plan for about six hours of prep for an on-location show. Why? Because there are all these other opportunities around you, and you need to prep for the client's content that you need to add, and you need to prep for any sound bits and things that might need to be edited, or the competitions and stuff that you'll have to play live, okay, there. So you're going to have a lot of opportunities to create different and exciting bits of content, but these need to be thought um, well through, otherwise you're going to sit with some issues. And you need to make sure that these things are still exciting and engaging and relatable for both of your audiences. There are certain outside broadcasts that we know happen every single year, like the cycle race okay, in Joburg. Every year happens and every year there's an OB from there. And the women's races always have an outside broadcast with the radio station from there. Also, keep in mind, you're still doing a show. This is by no means an infomercial, even though someone pays for it. If it's a paid for outside broadcast by a commercial partner, for instance, I don't know, Discovery, then what you do is you make sure that the commercial sales team defines exactly what message needs to be included at the broad in the broadcast. So the sales team is in charge of assisting and making sure all sales elements that should be included are included, but you still carry on with your show, okay? What you will do is you'll add one or two surprise, uh, special surprise and delight moments for your client, but you don't make the whole three hours about the client. Why? Because you'll lose your whole audience. So it won't be of any value then to, for instance, in this case, discovery if they are no listeners. What then next? Record and edit all interviews. If you were supposed to have a live interview, record that interview prior to your show, okay? And edit it before putting it on air. Because you don't want your guests to use up all your airtime by doing a live interview. Again, think about the way that we went through conducting interviews. But also, at these things, there are normally people that we get in to interview about this whole thing. It works to get them in prior, to edit it before putting it on air, to make sure that... Um, it sounds professional. Your audiences don't lose interest because you're still keeping it interesting for them. Then get an audience. So when you're at an outside broadcast, make sure that you set up in such a way that you are placed central to where everyone can see you. So you need to have a high visibility factor um, that can attract an audience. If I think about it, all the outside broadcasts that I've always been part of were set up in such a way where we knew they would be the most foot traffic. And We'd have competitions where we would give away CDs and food vouchers and um, different kinds of things, okay, as prizes, because we always did a dance off at some point or another because it looked cool, it was cool on recordings, and it sounded cool depending on how you brought that content across on air. Make sure that you are set up on a high footfall with visibility that can attract an audience. And if your show is early in the morning, Lure people with free breakfast or prizes. We've given away free coffee many a times at um, outside broadcasts in the mornings. So hearing audience laughter adds a new dimension to your show for your listeners. It's It brings an element of FOMO for you as the listener sitting somewhere else, not being there, because it sounds really fun in the background. And the ideas that it should make you think, oh, I wish I could be there. I remember we used to do a pool party every year. Um, and we used to broadcast this pool party too. And it always sounded so cool with the people in the background talking about the different competitions of what they're doing and people like doing slippery slides and blah, blah, blah. So it always sounded really cool as well, which is what you want at the end of the day. So multiple mics are a must. Why, hold on, before we do that, why can't we share one microphone? Uh, or have two microphones that the two co-hosts use and the one co-host can just share a microphone with the person that you're interviewing or talking to. Why does everyone need their individual microphones? Um, 
I'd say in terms of, let's say, the interviewee is a bit low, so you can up the volume on the on the on the microphone, and you can have different volumes. Yes. Yeah, and also I feel like it would take time because I mean we're not sitting in the same chair, mm. so passing the mic on and maybe changing positions and all that it could it could be time consuming as well. How smooth is this conversation? It won't it won't be as smooth because. Um, I don't I don't know if, if you'll get me, but then have you have you ever recorded and then you just hold the microphone and then it's just like it kind of feels like you're you have a spoon in a glass kind of kind of thing. I don't know if you get me. But then <laughs> that <laughs> that sound. It's yeah. Exactly. So it's not as smooth as it would be organically because there's a pause between answers, which we don't have if you and I are simply having a conversation because there's a pause between handing mics over. It really does impact your delivery. It changes the whole chemistry because it's, you might feel more comfortable with the flow of conversation like this, but as soon as I need to start handing over microphones, it breaks a little bit of that confidence as well, especially for the other person who might, who you are talking to. Yeah. Um, so it impacts the delivery and the chemistry of the presenters. So we need every single person that's there needs their own microphone for various reasons, like we've just seen. Then bring audio to your show. So what do we do? We record as much audio from the destination as possible. This can be used at two places. Firstly, on air, currently during your show, because it'll enhance your show and bring something different to the listening experience. Also, though, you can use that content afterwards when you got back to the studio to say, oh, look at this cool thing that happened today. OK, bring audio, record audio while you're there. Get people to walk around and record things and cut them and then you put them on air as that's what your production team can do while you are on air Okay, at this point. Then generate stories. So use every opportunity you can to create content and deliver great stories about this adventure. So make it a massive, big adventure. You might have heard something like this. There was a presenter who literally spoke about his whole journey about this is now like two months ago, three months ago, from getting on the plane to getting off the other side, what happened, his hotel, the whole experience about it. That's like similar to this example. You literally pay attention to what happens with everything from packing to driving to the airport to going through security to flying or getting lost on the way to your hotel. Um, anything of excitement of, or interest that happens, you can talk about. Okay. Then voice note things that happened while you're on this trip and plan how you will present them to your audience the next day. So like, for instance, if I had to talk about my morning while setting up for this brand awareness activation that uh, the company is doing, like, I mean, there's already content there because. Here we thought it was going to be the smooth sailing, easy morning. And then one of my staff members, the one who also had the banners in the car, firstly gets lost, secondly got into a car accident, making everyone run around to try and find her to get the stuff in her car. And then on the other side, she now needs to sort out, get someone out to come and fetch her car because her car can't start anymore, meaning she's out for the day, meaning everyone had to be rerouted and planned this whole thing. And at the same time, you don't want the people who are there to notice that anything is weird. So see, there's, there's always content that you can utilize around how your morning progressed up until this event. Then do not stress about technical problems. I have yet to go to an outside broadcast where there has not been an issue. There is so many times that the line drops. I mean, if you think about a, com a, com a commercial radio station doing an outside broadcast, some of them even have a satellite to broadcast from. Others have that or a Comrex, and they'll still set up Wi-Fi points at certain areas. And still the internet can drop, okay? Or your line can drop or whatever can happen. So be aware that technical problems can occur during an outside broadcast something always technically goes wrong. So be prepared for this. What is it going to help if you start freaking out and stressing? Um, again, I go back to you need to be in control at all times because if there's a crisis, who do we look at? We look at the person who's calm and collected, okay? Not that the one who's freaking out. So stay calm because losing your temper won't help fix any problems and it will um, affect the overall atmosphere of your show.
Then lastly, have fun. If you're having fun, so will your listener at the end of the day, right? So these are the main focus points with regards to an outside broadcast. What are the 10 points again? Do your normal show, but better. So keep in mind that everyone normally listening to your show will still be listening to your show, but now you also have additional people standing in front of you who are also tuning in to listen to your show, okay? So what does that mean? That means you need to plan ahead. You need to plan more because you need to plan how you're going to keep both parties happy and interested in your conversations. Then thirdly, it's a show, not an infomercial. So don't give your whole show over to the sponsor. Yes, they do pay a lot of money for it, but they also get their branding up there at this thing as well. Plus, you are giving them airtime. So wait for your sales team to communicate with you. And then you do add one or two nice surprise elements extra for them, um, which is what we call added value at the end of the day. But still, it's your show. Okay. Then number four. Record and edit all interviews prior to going on air live. Why? Because you have more control over it and you can make it sound more interesting and exciting. Number five, get a live audience. So make sure that are set up in such a way where people can see you and do games and fun things to attract them because you want that sound in the background of people roaming around. Number six, multiple microphones are a must, okay? Um, so we're still going to, uh, later on in the year, talk about different microphones, but every single person needs their own microphone to keep the flow going, okay? To make sure that the chemistry stays there that we have. Then number seven, bring audio to the show. So get people to walk around and record box pops or different pieces of audio that's cut and then put on the show while you're live, but also you can reuse this afterwards, okay? Then number eight, generate stories. So stories about what's happening now, but also what happened prior to leading up to this event. If you had to fly to somewhere else to do this event, or if you've had like a hectic morning with stuff happening. So generate stories, because at the same time, you're still trying to get people to keep listening to you. Then number nine, don't stress about a technical problem. There's always one. So if you've had one, great, <laughs> carry on. Then the last one is have fun. Outside broadcasts are fun, okay? Outside broadcasts are a lot of fun. I used to do even outside broadcasts at Buco. So like hardware shops, they would pay for us to come and do OBs. And then in between, I would DJ in between like presenting and things. So it's you can really have fun at these outside broadcasts. Now we're going to look at speciality shows, speciality broadcasting. What we're going to be focusing on today is called tragedies and sensitive topic shows. So... There's a specific way that you handle programming if something big goes wrong or if there's a big tragedy or if there's someone important who passed away or if there's certain sensitive topics. So that's what we're going to start looking at now. So what do we know about speciality broadcasting? I don't know how old you were when Nelson Mandela passed away or whether you were listening to the radio. But that's a day, for instance, that I'm never going to forget because I was still DJing at a corporate event that day. And I can tell you that was the most somber corporate event. Well, yeah, party I've ever been to in my life. And we still, the show still went on. We still had to DJ and get people to dance, et cetera, et cetera. But there was no vibe at all. Everyone was just in mourning. So it was a really interesting uh, day for me, partic particularly. But so speciality shows, in essence, what they are. They are shows that go against the grain of regular programming. What does that mean? It means I take the show that, as it normally would be and I chuck it out the window and I realign the show for the needs um, of the audience for today, for this specific show. Okay? So we have different, different types of sounds and different content to the rest of the shows on the station. We tend to, for instance, if a singer passes away we will dedicate a lot of song to them songs to them so we'll play a lot of music of that specific artist so there's one way where we're already throwing the programming out from a, a music perspective but we do the same from programming we don't do the normal content as we would have we're focusing on this event and what happened okay um i see your two hands i'm going to get to you now i don't even remember when he when he died i remember nothing about the day 
Yeah, you would still be quite young. Remember, I might not look it, but I am a lot older than you. So <laughs> it's possible. So speciality shows differ from normal programming. So with regards to normal programming, I might not have your songs on my system or playlist your songs, but I might on a speciality show still play songs of yours. So I think it's going to depend on the shows specifically. Ma'am, um, can I ask, do speciality shows only have to do with tragedy? Like can't people play uh, certain tracks, like let's just say it's the 16th of June yeah, or Freedom Day or whatever. Um, uh -huh. Aren't there cases whereby people then play songs that are um, produced back in the 80s, you know, the Freedom songs by Brenda Farsi and all those people? Like, yeah. can't that also? Oh, OK, OK, OK. Exactly. So we're just I'm just going I'm just teaching you about how to handle when a tragedy happens, um, how how programming changes. But no, there's. You get specialist programs, which are like your charts, et cetera, and then speciality shows. Every year during like um, a lot of these specific, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Commemorating days. We will change playlisting still, okay? Doesn't have to be a tragedy that happened right now, for instance, and you can um, commemorate certain people, again, who had an impact without not saying that, by playing their songs, for instance. Oh, now there are a lot of hands. Okay, I'm getting to you. I remember when Brenda Fassi died, the radio stations when talking about a lot her the whole day, play her music the whole day. Yeah, they would have. Okay. Very big influence. Um so regarding um uh, specialty shows, the storytelling format would differ in terms of uh telling the story. So would that mean whatever story that you're telling should not be about you or would you let somebody else to do that for you, talking about whoever that uh, person passed away and all of that stuff. Storytelling should never be about you in any case. It should have your point of view to explain why you are talking about the story, but it should be about the actual topic, right? About the story. So in this case, how you would um, you would share how you're feeling in this specific case, or perhaps you have a story. Um, as well to share on it, um, and then you'll touch on how it all comes in. The one thing you need to remember, when tragedy strikes, you are not a presenter separate from the audience. You are part of this community mourning the same thing. So you become one of them when we go through something like this, if that makes sense. Yes, yes, it does, ma'am. Yes, it does. Okay. Uh, Tando? Um, so I'll ask about Tibotaji show again. Was that a speciality show? Because mostly it was about women and his panel was mostly women and they were going on and on. Like the, basically the whole show was talking about women and everything. So that could also be a speciality show. That was definitely a speciality show. Yes, focused around Women's Month probably or Women's Day, whatever. And I have another question. Now it's tragedy. Let's say a radio station is celebrating their 10 year anniversary and then news break the biggest person to ever impact this world dies so now would it be insensitive to continue the show in like celebration mode yes. or you need to tone it down a bit you will have to tone it down a bit because it's you will be seen as disrespectful immediately ah but I, okay so now when are we going to celebrate our 10 year anniversary? Like it's today. The, you celebrate it then the next day or the next week or whatever it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Man. <laughs> Remember, like it's about respect and about how you are perceived from the audience perspective. How will it be? How will you be perceived if you carry on acting like nothing's wrong and like having this fat party? Yes, everyone does die. I agree with you. But still, um, don't you respect them by um, mourning them and attending funerals and remembering them? I like this class today. I like when you're um, interactive like this. Uh, Tando, your hand's still up. I'm not sure if you still wanted to say something or not. Sorry, ma'am, I don't. Okay. So what did we say? We said shows are programmed differently. So they can be specifically designed as a daily show or as a weekly show. 
Um, or these shows can happen in times of tragedy when radio stations to reflect the mood of the community deliberately modify their programming. We'll do that next week. Uh, Ma'am, let's just say, Ma'am, do you know the, the actor called, there's this actor called Bud Spencer. Yeah. Yes. The guy is extremely old. He's very old, but he's still alive. And a lot of people don't really know about him that much. So let's just say he were to die and people wouldn't really know how to um, like commemorate his death or celebrate his death. What would happen in that case? Because you don't know much about Bud Spencer, but then at the same time, you don't want to seem disrespectful by just continuing your show in celebration mode, like you said. So in that kind of a case, you would simply mention that this happened and mention some stuff that he did, for instance, um, but you won't focus, you won't do a show around it. So it's not just with when people die. Okay. Once again, think of 9-11. 9-11, we did this. COVID. COVID, we had weeks of speciality programming. Did you realize that within COVID, how programming changed to pretty much news stations? Um, because yeah. radio stations became the voice of the community, and the radio stations are where people went to go and voice what they thought. Um, and stations rallied to try and assist people. So that's a very good example of tragedy broadcasting. So I can't tell you what would the case will be because it'll depend on the radio station. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I want to go back to uh, the example that Amukelani came about with. And with what you said, how you answered it, is it because of like, um the station needs to be aware of its formats and its um audience in order for them to either decide to continue with that story or just mention it and move on so look at what the slide says here right um or was it in the previous slide now and we're still on this slide so radio stations reflect the mood of the community so depending on what the mood of that community is about this person, that will tell me a lot of how you will be handling that uh, specific death on air. Do you understand that? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma so the weekly or the daily speciality show um, is created to cater to a slightly different core target market or um, of a radio station and to attract a different audience. So certain speciality shows are there for different markets, okay? Commercially, these shows are about bringing in different groups of people that wouldn't ordinarily be catered for through normal programming. So different people who will li listen to it. There's someone here, EG says, why isn't there any specia specialist shows when one of our artists is nominated for a BT? or the Grammy Award, or is it speciality shows when it's tragedy only? So today we're specifically talking about um, tragedy speciality shows, okay? So what happens in the sense of tragedy? But when that kind of stuff happens, they do do that. They, they um, a lot of radio stations make a massive hype um, and will, um, yeah, like stand behind the artist, okay? So it's not a case I'm not sure if they'll do a whole show necessarily. Um, they might actually. So I think it's, it's, I can't tell you that they don't do that. Some stations will do that and will like, but radio stations overall tend to stand behind artists that get uh, any type of recognition and will go out of their way to make sure that there are features talking about this kind of stuff. But for today, we're just on tragedies and sensitive topics. Okay, so 5 December 2013, the day that South African broadcasters have been preparing for, because we did know this day will come at some point, um, but we're hoping would never arrive, was the day that Nelson Mandela passed away. It was the moment in which radio stations across the country got to throw out the format book, the music policies, and all regulatory restrictions, and just, just be real, just be real people. The country was in mourning and it was the job of every radio station to capture the national mood. So that's what you do here. Most radio stations had imaging packages and audio already on standby, um, but it wasn't this aspect. 
that made radio so brilliant over this time. It was the fact that every presenter and every caller became vulnerable and intimate and real. It was an incredible few days in which radio, sh radio showed that it can be the greatest companion and that it has the ability to truly connect with people. This is exactly what we saw when COVID hit, okay? This is what happened when we went into lockdown. People were afraid. They were stressed, worried, um, not just about whether they're going to be sick and whether family member is going to pass away, but also about are they going to have a job. Or during the COVID period, people lost their jobs. They lost family members. We all, I don't well, I don't know about you, but most of us would know people who passed away, whether it's family members or friends or um, anyone that you knew. So we all went through this thing together. And what did we do? We relied on radio. We relied on the radio stations to give us the stats. Tell us what is going on. What does this mean when the president said this? What is happening around the world? OK, so radio became the go to. It was really a case of, and you could phone in and have your voices expressed, and the radio station presenters did the same. They became vulnerable. They told you they had someone who just passed away. Um, they told you like about all their family members who lost their jobs, and they're so stuck. And we all went through trauma during this period. So radio had to bring this mood across and it did okay like it literally showed this it was the same thing they were people were vulnerable and intimate and real and we were connecting with people during this period okay on this day south african broadcasters learned how they could become the go-to medium when tragedy hits if we look at the first couple of days of after nelson mandela passed away in terms of broadcasting Firstly, South African broadcasting had the opportunity to truly reflect the mood of the country. They took callers, they allowed them to cry, they allowed them to share intimate emotions. When other tra tragedies hit or sensitive topics arise, allow your listeners to be open and honest and to share their experiences and feelings with you, okay? We, this is when we come together as people. This is not a time where you exclude um, your listeners. So during this time, music stations um, did not leave the news to the news stations. Again, think of COVID. They integrated in, into their programming. So news became part of a music radio station during these times. And it gave listeners all the information that they needed, okay, that they wanted. Music stations were teaming up with news partners to come, um, to come up with teaming up with news partners to make sure that the news was credible and reliable that they were talking about on air at all times to make sure factually they had um everything correct and the stats correct and we had people on air daily um questioning things that the government was doing and um we spoke to so many different types of experts and specialists in different fields about how we should be conducting things right now. So we were, radio stations really gave us the opportunity to take as much information and in as we can for us to understand what it is that we are going through, okay, when the pandemic hit. So radio stations reacted quickly and took charge of the situation. Once again, when Nelson Mandela passed away, Many took it upon themselves to organize a vigil outside Mandela's uh, family home in Houghton, and others gave away candles and letters for their listeners in which personal stories were written to the Mandela family. So take note of this approach, because as much as you are doing things on air, it's also um, important that you remember that you form part of a community. You need to do something off air as well. It doesn't have to be like this. Again, think of COVID. And, Think of what was done during those times. And there have been times where there were hectic water crises um, in this country. And then stations came together and um, got massive big water tanks to drive through and to be delivered um, to certain farmers in certain areas. OK, so it's also about what happens on the ground. So music radio station played music that best summed up the mood. The radio, music radio is in the perfect position to bring listeners together through the power of music. 
Um, so in such times, you should throw out your regular playlist and reflect the mood through song. Um, presenters, like I said, were real and they were vulnerable, but they made it about the listeners, still not about themselves, okay? Still about your listener. Um, giving your point of view, but it's still about the listener. The nation turned to radio for information about the events after Mandela's passing and to be the shoulder to cry on. Everything was focused on the listeners, not the presenters. It's crucial in such times to be there for listeners emotionally and to reflect their experiences. Think of 9-11, very, well, very good example, same kind of content. But I think the best example I can possibly give you is COVID because you lived through it, you experienced it, and you would have seen how radio stations conducted themselves and the types of content that were created. And there was innovation during this time as well, by the way. So this is the same for any topics that are extremely sensitive. Presenters should allow their communities to reflect how they feel. Okay. Um, so to emphasize, presenters should not make these moments about them. Uh, I want to show you this. Let me just quickly copy it. So what happened during COVID was that, like I said, a lot of innovation. Why? Because programming had to change. The way that we did radio up until this point, um, could no longer happen. We couldn't do radio this way anymore because you can't be in a studio first and foremost, okay? So we had to change our thinking overnight about how we're doing this whole thing. So there was an awards, um, an actual radio awards that P1 Media Group did. Let me just quickly find it. You should see coronavirus radio ideas based of awards. So it incorporated Radio Days Europe, Radio Days Africa, uh, Asia, and um, Podcast Day. So here you can see things, for instance, like best uh, social media video, then there's a social distancing video, best virtual event, um, Up Yours Corona, best parody, Wash For Me, best virtual concert, We Are One Africa, best uh, station promo, keep, uh, keeps New York connected, Based community service, let ma let's make some noise. Based social media visual. Um, Based community spirit. Based sales promotion. Okay. Uh, Based mega promotion. Based reporting slash journalism. Based podcast creativity and entertainment. Based podcast long form storytelling. So when you have a chance, Go through some of these and just listen to what they did and see what they did. Okay, get an idea of everything that happened. Because I mean, like you can see, it's different places that got involved. So here it's Malaysia and UK, Australia, Kenya, um, USA, UK, Kenya again, UK again, USA, um, Germany, Spain. So it's not from one specific platform or place. Right, so radio really came up and stood up and we could really see how much more we could do as a radio station during this time, All right? Stay connected during difficult times. Don't just report on events, but feel them because your audience will be, okay? Remember, you don't wanna be seen as um, cold hearted and switched off from society if everyone around you, around you is in deep mourning. So make recordings on the streets of locals. Ask what they saw, what they heard, how they felt. Uh, tragedies allow presenters and shows to step out of their comfort zones and to discuss what else can be done to add layers to your content. If your show is aimed at parents, ask how parents can explain the event to their children, like assist them. Open up debates and ask hard questions. Find a personal way to deal with tragedies that have multiple casualties. Um, once again, COVID or even the war. Imagine how the radio stations um, in Ukraine will be broadcasting about this on a day-to-day -day basis. Radio stations must do everything they can to help their communities. Okay? Allow your listeners to share their feelings on air and on social media. So that is um, everything about speciality broadcasting in terms of tragedies.
Any questions? Ooh, hold on, that's something here. With that being said, the monkeypox almost replaced COVID after that one case that was found here in SA. I assume a lot of presenters prepared for an outbreak. Why aren't we updated about this now? Is it cured or is it still out there? Um, it's still out there. It's just that in South Africa, it's not a big thing. And it hasn't become this epidemic that they've been afraid it would become. So, um, I mean, the UK and the United States did declare it an epidemic, but I haven't seen the cases rise yet. So for us, remember also how people focus on certain subjects. If it's not in your circle, if it doesn't affect you, you tend to talk about it less. Same as the war. It's something that was spoken about a lot in the beginning, the same with monkeypox, but then as soon as it's outside of our vicinity, so it's not in our bubble, it doesn't really directly affect us anymore, people tend to start talking about things less. Um, if that answers your question. Any other questions for me? Nothing, happiness? <laughs>